Hello and welcome to the Wednesday DC Today. So yes, we are now uh, through that halfway point of the week and then some. And we had a very rare occasion in the Dow today. Um, I have seen it before actually. Um, and there's a part of me that thinks we saw it earlier this year, although I think that was the S&P, not the Dow. Uh, but I haven't seen it may but maybe three times in, you know, 25 years of doing this. Um, the Dow was up 0.00%. Now, because it was up one point, uh, you know, from a roughly 33 to 34,000 point denominator, it was technically up 0.0001%, but flat as can be in the Dow. Um, the S&P was down 19 basis points and the NASDAQ was down uh, let's see, the exact amount was 51, yeah, 51 basis points. So you you had a little bit of downside with the tech side. Communication services was the worst performing sector. It was down 93 basis points. Um, so not, not a very exciting day in the market overall, but nevertheless, um, that flat thing on the Dow I thought would be uh, interesting to you. Okay, there uh, in terms of the stuff that was kind of, up today. We've had a real theme here, you may have noticed this week, and I wanted to reiterate what, what that's about, is that we are, um, uh, the best performing sector was in, excuse me, the healthcare side, it was 85 basis points. Consumer staples were up 38 basis points. Real estate was up a quarter of a percent. Those were the only three positive performing sectors. So whether it's been the only positive space or the least negative space, you're now working on four or five days of um, the defensive type sectors doing much better. And so there's a real theme going on right now. We'll see how long it lasts. I think it has most everything to do with uh, advance to where the Fed is gonna be next week. Um, there's a lot of things I actually wanna talk about. And so I hope I can make it more interesting um, first of all, it just has to be repeated because if the facts change, I'll change having to say the same thing, but the, the facts keep repeating themselves that uh, the 10-year bond yield was down nine uh, and a half base points today. It's down, the 10-year is down to 3.42%. Okay, so that is from the high level of the yield, which was now a little over five weeks ago. That is just a monstrous rally in bonds and it continues. Now the one year, now let's use the six month just because it's maximum drama. The six month T-bill is 4.7%. The 10 year is 3.4%. So that is a heavy degree of inversion, obviously. Heavy degree of inversion, heavy um, signal, or, or belief being priced into markets of a policy mistake from the Fed. And, and also just to me, um, an incredibly loud claim from markets, a belief being expressed in price discovery in, the, in bond yields that we are looking at um, the Fed doing a lot of tightening on the front end and then um, significant disinflation and uh, compression of growth pushing things down on the on the longer end. Um, the 30 year is technically not inverted to the 10 year. Uh, there's a lot of uh, optimism for growth from 10 to 30 years because the yield goes from 3.42 percent to 3.43 percent. So you can pick up one extra basis point by extending the amount of time before the government pays you back your money an additional 20 years. So there you go. Um, those are real life market price signals and I assure you they mean something. Uh, as expected, the Senate is now 51-49 for the next two years, <clears throat> uh, majority to the Democrats as um, the incumbent Senator in Georgia won the election in their runoff last night, and um, it comes on the heels of a Republican governor winning by a landslide. 
and then now a Democrat senator winning. And so, you know, the message in all that politically, I've, I've written about, spoken about, I think it's painfully obvious. And then in terms of uh, where we go into 2024, it'll be very interesting. Um, I would love for there to not have to be a lot of talk about electioneering for a little while. Um, but, you know, you might get uh, into like the second quarter of 23. And then by then, you may not have as much heavy focus on the midterms in markets. Uh, excuse me, the, mid, the, the 2024 election, uh, House and Senate in markets. But by then, you're going to have a presidential primary going on and whatever drama is surrounding that. So I think that we'll be lucky uh, to get um, four to six months of uh, election-free living before this stuff comes back in, in full effect. Economically, a few things I want to highlight about today. China's abandonment of their COVID zero policy is absolutely accelerating. Um, the problem, I guess I would say, is some of the things it's accelerating from are going from the just fantastically ridiculous to something a little bit less fantastically ridiculous. That's not exactly the stuff that screams, you know, global reopening, but they're, they're moving in the right direction and um, at a better pace than maybe some thought a couple weeks ago. Um, tax loss selling, I do think it has exacerbated some of the um, volatility to the downside in markets in the last few days. You're, you've seen some of the worst performers of the year do worse, the worst. And that generally is that those are the areas that then are getting sold off to capture tax loss. And it's never perfectly scientific. It's never perfectly accurate. But in a year like this year, anecdotally, I feel comfortable saying that it's at least a factor. Um, now, do I think that people are really throwing in the towel on a lot of the lower quality stuff? You know, you look at how well energy is done on the year, and then you look at some of these tech things, particularly non-profitable tech. So Fang, for all of its overvaluation problems, is our profitable companies, and um, or at least capable of being profitable. Um, it, when you look at things like ARC and the kind of innovation tech index space, uh, over a billion dollars more has flowed into that than like energy sector ETFs on the year. I, it's real hard to call a bottom in the frothy stuff of markets. And it's real hard to call a top in energy when things like that are taking place. Speaking of bottoms and tops and things, bank stocks are at a two year relative price low to the S&P. Um, that's, that's quite interesting uh, in terms of where we are right now with the yield curve and um, just overall economic outlook. Um, the banks and their defense have done a really good job talking down expectations. Uh, you don't get much more pessimism than hearing some of these bank folks talk. And they're either, um, you know, they either are right or they're wrong about what they're saying. Speaking of being right and what people are saying, uh, John Burns Real Estate Consulting, by far one of the most valuable sources of information in the residential real estate space. Uh, their indexes for home price levels in November show double digit declines since the peak level of March and April. Um, in a number of major U.S. cities, uh, San Francisco was the worst off, down 13 percent, um, just in basically what amounts to about a seven or eight month period. Austin and San Jose are both down 11 percent. Las Vegas was down 10 percent. So you are seeing certain markets that are either distressed for a number of reasons or were themselves rather frothy, like Austin and Vegas, dropping double digits. Uh, many more markets are expected to be down from peak to trough double digits here this month. Now, the mortgage rate uh, is sitting at 6.41% on the long mortgage. It had been 714 a month ago, so that's moved down, as much as you've seen the 10-year and 30-year move down. And then on the policy front, uh, the National Defense Authorization Act has gone to the House. It was filed in the House. I think they're going to end up getting this through in the lame duck. It's an $858 billion bill, so the Republicans were successful in getting more defense written into the Defense Authorization Act. I mean, that call me crazy, you know, but that seems like what, what you do with a defense bill is you, is you do defense spending. So 
really wild stuff there. Um, there were a few little adjustments coming from the initial legislation. First of all, they did end up in this version that has now gone uh, uh, filed in the House, uh, eliminating a vaccine mandate for those in the military. Um, the Senator Manchin energy permitting bill that was shut down um, last year by Congress did not end up getting snuck in as an attachment to the NDAA. So um, there's a few other little, uh, frankly, kind of reprehensible add-ins that were being considered to attach to the bill. It's one of these political things where they're daring someone to vote no on something by attaching it to a pretty popular and important piece of legislation. And a lot of those kind of uh, add-ins did end up getting struck. They didn't make the final cut. Um, and then finally on economic data, used vehicles hit their lowest level in over a year. It's outright deflation, not merely disinflation. Disinflation is a decrease in the rate of price growth. Deflation is a negative price growth. And um, you're now down almost 16% uh, since the beginning of the year in the used auto vehicle space, which was a huge part of the inflation we'd had previously. I don't normally in the podcast and the video go into the Q&A um, that I'm doing in the written DC Today. I like to make that kind of a unique part of the daily written that people are getting some live Q&A. Those are all real questions from real people. And I answer them all myself every day. And yet I thought that this question and the answer I want to give um, did uh, warrant a little um, conversation here on uh, for those listening to the podcast and so forth. I'm going to read this individual's question word for word, but then I'll go, I won't read my answer the way it's written in DC Today verbatim. I'll just talk to you um, straight up. He says, we seem to now be living in opposite land. Anytime there's good news, stocks drop. And when there's data suggesting that recession's coming, the market has a massive update. Um, Every time the job report comes out, strong stocks go down. I totally understand the underlying reason, inflation and the Fed raising rates, but there's bad news that seems to suggest inflation will go away and the Fed can slow, pause, or even reverse rate hikes. Stocks go up. However, isn't it just inherently wrong that we're celebrating harm to the economy and booing when it's resilient? Is this a further breakdown between Wall Street and Main Street? Would appreciate if you have some thoughts on what's happening here, if it's the right way of thinking, if there's some investment insights on how to deal with this current opposite day environment. And so what I basically said back to him is that, of course, I agree entirely um, that there is something very, I think, uh, perverted about the idea that many people believe that more people having jobs is a bad thing for the economy. Now, the one thing I got to say is in fairness, some people could view it as bearish for markets, not because they believe that jobs really are a source of inflation, but merely because they believe that the Fed believes that. And so they're acting on what they think the Fed might do, um, that it's going to impact Fed policy. They're going to end up raising rates more. They're going to not uh, cut as soon as we thought, you know, with good economic news. And so it, it, someone could be wrong in that thought, but at least that default is a, uh, thought's a little more explainable as to why they're doing it. it. It doesn't defy rationality to believe that the Fed may be responding that way. Now, the Fed has most certainly talked that way. Um, and, and now we are stuck in a position, in my opinion, we're oftentimes in the short term for markets, as uh, this individual says, opposite day, what seems to be good can be bad and what seems to be bad can be good. But this is the thing I want to point out. More people having jobs and wages is not inflationary if you understand what inflation is, which is too much money chasing too few goods and services. And more people having jobs is producing more goods and services. Now, it's true, they get paid. And so you could say, oh, yeah, we're also pro really provoking demand there. And if you think the way to not let demand be overheated is to make people lose their jobs, I don't think you're thinking about it right economically, and nor does that sound like a particularly humane aspiration. The fact of the matter is that people having jobs does not overheat demand um, unless you have an entire job sector that shouldn't exist because monetary policy has provoked 
zombieism or silly speculation. So you can have unproductive jobs, but the notion that we need to have people lose productive jobs and that wages can be actually paying for themselves through greater productivity from the workforce, uh, I, I don't know what to say about that. But uh, uh, why markets go up or down in the short term makes sense because I think people are trying to front run the Fed. Midterm and long term, I would just tell you, I think that people having jobs is a pro-cyclical, virtuous, uh, appropriate expectation in economy. And whatever good news you find, it should never result in, in negative long-term view in risk assets. Short-term could be different because of the disproportionate role that the Fed has. But I got to say, um, this financialization process where people are more focused on trying to front run, front run what they think traders are going to think about other things versus that kind of fundamental assessment markets, I don't think it's good. And I think it's a byproduct of an excessively interventionist Fed. And in a world that has a more right-sized Fed, which is what I wrote Dividend Cafe about last week, I don't think you end up with people celebrating bad news or, or mourning good news. Uh, so that's all I want to close with. I do appreciate listening to DC Today. Look forward to another DC Today with you tomorrow and Thursday. And then, of course, our Dividend Cafe on Friday. Thanks so much for listening to and watching the DC Today.